Hello, and welcome to Genius League Smart Bites, powered by HPE. I'm Lindsay Wagaman, Partnerships Intern here at Evil Geniuses, and I'll be your host tonight for the winning numbers conversation. We will be discussing ways for viewers to break into the esports industry with insights from our guests. We'll be answering questions as well from the audience, so if you have questions, feel free to put them in Twitch chat. We're very honored to have our partners at HPE present this entire Smart Bite series. HPE is the official Data Insights Partner of EG and is working with our coaching staff to create AI and machine learning tools to analyze gameplay and evolve team strategy. We've worked with them to show our fans more data and insights, and their logo is proudly worn on the shoulder of our jersey. Stay tuned for a lot more exciting things from our partnership with HPE. But for now, let's introduce our three special guests. Chris Diapolonio, Chief Innovation Officer, Ivan Shang, Data Scientist, and Carrie Sunderland, Director of Product Operations. Welcome all. We're very excited to have you all here and kicking off our Smart Bites panel tonight. So Chris, would you mind kicking us off and telling us your title as well as the summary of your job? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Um, my name is Chris Diapolonio. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer here at Evil Geniuses, and I oversee all of our main business verticals, partnerships, marketing, and innovation, um, and happy to be here. Excited to chat. Fantastic. Carrie, would you mind going next? Yes, I'm so excited to be here with Ivan and Chris and you, Lindsay. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles, and I am our director of product operations for our innovations team. So I work really closely with our data scientists, business intelligence, um, and software engineering uh, teams that support all of our kind of data work that we do here at EV. Fantastic. And certainly, last but not least, Ivan, if you could wrap us up then. Oh, Ivan, you might be muted. Well, whoops. <laughs> I, I am Ivan. Uh, I'm a data scientist over at EG. I help quantify in-game strategy execution in an attempt to help our analysts and coaching staff's lives just a little bit uh, easier. Uh, I also manage uh, three interns, which is always a fun, you know, meeting. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Now let's talk a little bit about how you all found your way into your current positions. Now, Chris, would you mind sharing a little bit more about your background and what led you here to EG? Yeah, it's uh, quite, a, quite a long story. So, uh, I, you know, I, I grew up in and, and got my start in the sports world, working in sports sponsorships um, and sponsorship marketing. So working with corporate brands, on how they got into, you know, what sponsorships they did, you know, how they activated them, um, and started to push them into doing esports partnerships um, while I was with a few agencies, and then really wanted to get in on the property side, working for a team, and so moved over to the team side where I was working in partnerships, and eventually was able to make my way into the executive level of a, of an Overwatch League team um, before uh, finding Evil Geniuses and really you know, seeing what EG was trying to do and changing the way that esports should be and that, you know, gaming should be from an inclusivity and accessibility standpoint and using data uh, to do some of that was really, really exciting to me and something I want to be a part of. And so it's been here since uh, August of 2020 and, um, you know, up here in Seattle now, uh, it's been phenomenal. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, Ivan, would you mind sharing a little bit about your path to the evil side as well? Yeah, um, I came from a marketing data science background straight out of college. Um, I kind of left that world maybe four years into it to work on data governance and instrumentation over at Disney Plus uh, before coming over here to EG after finishing my master's degrees. Uh, master's degree, sorry. Um, I currently also work as a Code Academy content contributor as well as a bootcamp mentor. Um, Chris is actually the one who found me. Fun fact. Yeah, I was gonna say we. I, I know we. We'll get to. Let's have Carrie introduce herself, and let's go back to that, Ivan, real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the like the peanut butter in the middle of the sandwich. Um, so um, I'm Carrie Sunderland. Like I said, I come from Peak Six. Um, what brought me to Evil Genius is um, I had worked in several different industries. So 
insure tech, online dating even, um, fintech. And I had talked to Chris and Ben Brooks, and I was just super interested in what we were trying to do here um, with data. Um, I was really excited about the team that they had built here. Um, I was so excited about um, the engineers that we have in Belfast. Um, we have several data scientists here um, in Seattle, Ivan in New York. And so what really attracted to me uh, to Evil Geniuses was the team aspect, um, not only from a competitive gaming standpoint, but also just from the team that I got to work with from a technical perspective. That's awesome. Thank you all. Now, Chris, can we go back to that factoid yeah. you guys were talking about? Yeah, I think it's I think it's like a great story and probably leans into the whole idea of like how how do you get into esports, right? And um, that's I know that's a question that comes up a lot, and I know that's one we'll get to at the end. But for those who don't know, we have created a product called Factor at Factor.gg. It's a stats and analytics platform around League of Legends. And at the time when we were building it in 2021, we were looking for people to help us with content on the site. And so, like, I was looking around the internet, and I came across some some person uh, named Ivan who was doing uh, like regression analysis and trying to predict uh, like how teams would place in LCS. Um, and so, I saw this, and I was like, "Oh, this is really cool! This is the stuff, kind of content we want on the site? Let me try to figure out like who is this person." And so, I was able to like figure out. Um, Ivan, Ivan Chang, and then I figured like NYU, and I was able to like f find him, I think on LinkedIn and message him through that. And it was, I mean, an absolute kiss met of like figuring it, finding the right person at the right time. But I think it goes to show that like you can really get into esports in, in a multitude of ways. And, um, and like if you're passionate about it, you should, you should do or make things about it that align with what you love. And, you know, it was like a perfect, you know, Austin or Ivan loves, you know, League of Legends and data science and was able to come up with some great content. We brought him in to do that, but then we evolved the relationship. He did great from there. And then he brought on, he started doing development work for us, doing some prediction modeling, and then we we're able to bring him out full time. And so it was, you know, I mean, it's one of those crazy stories of like, how'd you get into esports? I think like Ivan, you downplayed it. You're super skilled and highly skilled. That's why you're here. But it's just like a really awesome, like I lucked out because we got a great person in house, but you know, I, I wanted to make sure we figured out a way to keep you. And so after it was content, it was like, okay, let's get him to do some work for us, you know, on the side from a modeling standpoint, and then let's figure out how we get him in here full time because he kept, he kept killing it. And that's, I think like when you're giving your shot, you got to go for it and put in all your effort. So I know, I mean, I just, I, I don't want, I know we've got an agenda to derail, but I think like for people listening, like who want to know how to get in, like there's multitude of ways, but when you get that opportunity, you, you know, make the most of it. Yeah, absolutely. Ivan, is there anything that you want to add to that story? Uh, n nothing, nothing really. I mean, Chris definitely got the, 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 the entirety of the situation probably, uh, even more than, than what I was definitely going to say to that one. Well, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. That was very, very awesome to hear. Now to switch gears a little bit, let's move into the importance of data. So to you all, how would you say the integration of data analysis has transformed the landscape of esports? Maybe maybe I'll start out with that, and then we can and kind of round robin it. But I think with the evolution um, of data analysis, it's created a precise player and team performance evaluation where you can have more strategic decision making in game um, with data driven insights. And it also has helped our preparation um, and reshape that fundamentally, especially if you think about a game like League of Legends and how you're looking at opponents and their picks and their bans. It's fundamentally like elevated layers of information that coaches have to make really, really um, make maybe decisions that they wouldn't make because they don't they have that third eye. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was definitely going to add on. Um, we can definitely be you know way more precise and like efficient with how we kind of look at games since uh, we can obtain data at such a scale these days. 
Um, not saying that like this would ever kind of replace analysts or coaches, but ideally we, you know, going back to what I, what I do, ideally we, we empower them and make their lives just a little bit easier by kind of getting rid of the mundane or tedious tasks and kind of uh, gather the information for them so they can spend more time doing the cool insights and, you know, really helpful um, advice that they give to our players. Hey, Chris, I'm curious, how have you even like seen it transform at EG over the years too, not just in the whole space? Yeah, I, I would say like before I got here, we didn't even have an innovation department, right? And so like when you think about how this is transforming the landscape, it's it's creating like careers and jobs for people in, in the esports space overall, right? And that I think is, you know, that is something you've seen in traditional sports teams. You've seen it on like, the business side with brands from having business intelligence units, but like really a lot of teams r run very, I would say lean and, and more on focused on like the competitive side. And we are building another vertical to support our teams. And as you said, make them more efficient and more effective. Um, but I don't, I think this will continue. And I don't think we're going to be the only team to have our own department of engineers and data scientists um, who will continue to, 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 to change that um, and we'll, even from like a social perspective and business intelligence perspective, we, you know, this isn't new, but like within esports, I don't know if a lot of teams are taking the time to analyze content and content output to see what can be most efficient and how to be most effective with their posts and, um, and everything that lives digitally since we don't, do a lot physically, right? We have to be smart about uh, about the data we get from the platforms that we that we post and interact on. Yeah, fantastic. Now, Carrie, I know you mentioned League a little bit, but would you be able to kind of talk about some other specific examples of how these data driven insights have driven innovation, whether it's with League or um, on the EG side, and kind of improve decision making? Yeah, that's a great question. So Chris mentioned a little bit about our marketing team. So one of the things that um, I've had the pleasure of doing is working side by side with our junior data scientist, Austin Oliver, who we worked really, really hard to establish some key processes to normalize data so that we could have more concrete insights, categorization, segmentation for how we're just posting um, on our platforms across many, many different social channels. How can we look at that, what's working, what's not working, and give the best output to our fans um, and also our partners? And so that's also helped us kind of know kind of the keep doing this, stop doing this, try this, and see how it works. And so it's really, really kind of elevated our ability um, to communicate to our fans. I love that. That's fantastic. Now, Chris, I know Carrie mentioned some of the downsides what would you say some of the key challenges are or barriers that, you know, EG or other organizations face when it comes to harnessing the power of data effectively? And then how can these challenges be overcome and unlocking the full potential? Yeah, I'd love for Ivan to dive into this after I kind of tee him up because he's he's living this on a daily basis. But I think, like, initially when I got here, one of the biggest challenges was we know there's game data out there. How do we access it? <laughs> And where can we get it from so that it's clean and usable and in a fashion uh, that actually has, you know, has some value to us. And so we had to look for data providers from whether that's the, the developers themselves or third party companies who can provide us with um, an API or access to that data so we can bring it in into our database, ingest it, and then work on it from there and i think like the biggest challenge and barrier is like there's the data is complex and sometimes it's not super clean and that is that is a problem that you know you can't do anything with it ivan right and unless like you actually have like good data in place yeah preferably it be very clean data and you know riot does a fantastic job with with clean data but then sometimes you have to work with like a valve when it comes to Dota or Counter-Strike. And when you're working with that company or that publisher rather, uh, you go from structured data to very, very unstructured data that has a lot of like kinks into um, how the data is recorded and you know who you're working with. So, um, you, you know, you're, you're really in, <laughs> you're really knee deep into Python 
and just like ETL tools for the majority of the day. Um, as much fun as you know, ML and you know, AI even these days sound. Um, the the bulk of the work really does start from the from cleaning messy data up. Yeah, awesome. Now, Carrie, in what ways would you say that data analysis has kind of contributed to optimizing operational efficiency and cost effectiveness within organizations, whether EG or Peak Six? And then what measurable impacts would you say it's had on the bottom line? Oh, awesome. So I think one of the things that um I was just talking about in a meeting today is um, even just cost analysis and how much we spend maybe on a certain piece of marketing and how it performs and keeping track of that so that we can kind of find that right mix and predict how much we should continuously spend and how much we should really spend on things like that. Um, the other, I would say like in, as, as far as like other efficiencies it's created, I think um, I mentioned when you look at the insights and you see what's performing, you stop spending time on things that aren't working, um, spend you you you. This is a problem for every business. Is if you're not measuring kind of output and performance on anything or any activity you do, you kind of fall into this trap of you keep doing things over and over just because you've always done them. But if you have this data and you can look at the performance and you can look at the reception, you can make better decisions um, and stop. You know, give your your employees time where they're focusing on winning things versus things they're just doing it over and over that are that are losers. Um, I would say some other things at Peak Six where we've had to create um, efficiencies using data is when I was working on one of our insurance companies, uh, we did a thorough work through of our workflows and how the flow works through and you could timestamp and kind of target like how, if we can cut down these things, like how does that get it into like a policy into the mail to an end user quicker. And so just analyzing and looking at data to derive where you're actually gonna like operationalize or automate things versus we're just gonna automate everything because the landscape's so big. And if you just say, we're gonna do everything all at once, it really helps you pinpoint where you should focus kind of those uh, automation efforts. Yeah, and kind of focusing on automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Ivan, I think you touched on it before, but how is the availability of vast amounts of data and advancements in technology like AI and machine learning kind of revolutionized the potential for analysis and predictive modeling in various fields? Yeah, I, I think it definitely brings it more to the, I, I, get, I don't want to call them couch potato or couch analysts uh, or armchair analysts, but it does, you know, give these powerful tools to a wider set of audience. So what was originally, you know, at, at the back end, just very advanced statistical concepts is boiled, now boiled down to just, you know, a couple lines of code from like sklearn uh, by using Python. Um, but outside of that, I don't think it's actually revolutionized uh, analytics or data science, uh, specifically in, in regards to AI, because kind of at the end of the day, you're still you still need someone to interpret that data. So, like, what's what's the point of having a data scientist if if they can't translate their own output or if they don't even understand what, you know their their output to begin with? So I think AI will you know eventually help us more in this realm, but. For the time being, I've been using ChatGPT to provide like template or boilerplate code, um, or to provide some form of like baseline, uh, like baseline code to work with when I'm trying to figure out some form of complicated uh, solution. Um, like right now, at the moment, I, I think the the best way to describe it is that it feels like you have your, you, it feels like you you have writer's block and you have your college writing professor on on call twenty four seven. Uh, and that's what it, that's what having ChatGPT feels like for a programmer, at least. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, Carrie, and I think Chris, you can also touch on this one as well. Um, but in what ways has the data team at EG collaborated with other departments, whether it's coaching, partnerships, marketing, to kind of maximize the value and impact of data analysis across different facets here at EG? Um, so I'll give uh, one example and then Chris, maybe you can go next. So as far as like cross collaboration, like I think one good opportunity we've had is working with our partnerships to attract sponsorships. Um, EG has a lot of really, really great values. Um, and we help um, our team find those insights. Who are our fans? Um, who 
who should esports be? Those are our fans. And we help elevate those insights to our, par our partners um, so that they can see who we are. They're attracted to what we're um, putting out there in the world of esports and the difference that we're trying to make. Um, and we just show them kind of with our data and with our um, audience insights that we are a great partner for, for the reasons that they're trying to get into the space, they're trying to get into the market. Um, or attracting maybe the other in the room because um, I think we are the, the esports team for um, people that want to belong, that should belong. Yeah, and when, it look, when we look at like that side of it with the partnerships or business intelligence, a lot of brands that our partnerships team are talking to, they've heard of esports, they've heard of gaming, but they don't, you know, they're not really sure of who the fan base is, what they're interested in, um, how, you know, how many impressions they're going to get or engagements they will get on um, on opportunities or promotions. And, and so, like, we're able to showcase that to them, you know, ahead of time and throughout the partnership to help them understand the value of it. And so, like, it's a it's a it's a lot of using data for education i think when we look at some of our partnership sales um and helping them better understand who our fan is and what what is our fan actually like or is interested in um and when we look at like collaboration i, I like eg is one of, like one of our base tenants is like we should be using data to make decisions like all the time and data driven decision making should flow through everything we do and so like Carrie, myself, Ivan, like we are working with every department here at Evil Geniuses, um, from HR to you know to marketing to partnerships to gaming, and I know we'll get in a little bit more. I think to to some of the specifics around gaming, but we've got you know our engineering and data science team is in is in our our team Discord. We've got our own channel for feedback and discussion. We have weekly weekly sometimes daily calls set up with with certain departments. Um, there is a lot of uh, a lot of data literate people, and we're gr trying to grow that data literacy here across the teams. Uh, that's been a big initiative for our team within innovation to continue to help people understand what value they can get from data and how to use it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, this collaboration that you mentioned, and also. All the collaboration with data in general, how would you say, I don't know if we've touched on it, um, or if you could touch on a little bit more, how does it contribute to the overall success of EG as an esports powerhouse? Um, so I'm I'm thinking of one <laughs> of one project in particular that um Angie on our team has just been working really, really closely with Soham that's um in charge of CSGO on and which is our scouting tools and that can that is that is imperative to creating a good roster for us and finding maybe the people that aren't seen and using data and ranking systems to kind of elevate those people that might not have been sought after otherwise yep i think the opportunity when you look at like how large of like a player base these games have like, um it even goes back to you know some of the combines we've been running with hpe um, and we'll continue to run, but like one we did earlier for Valorant, we're playing right now, um, Demon One, one of our new players, right? He came through an open combine tryout and we tested the players on on Aim Lab and through a series of tests, right? To look at the data to see mechanically how skilled were some of these players before we brought them into scrims and like actually understood communication style and other intangibles. And so you know, Demon won, he, like, over 11 trials, I think his average ranking out of over 100 uh, contestants was 4.9. He was, like, in the 95th to 98th percentile of every trial we did, um, and was, like, just mechanically off the charts. And so when you look at, like, that kind of information to help you understand, like, okay, this is a player we should have our eyes on when we actually have our coaches and analysts watch the scrims and do a little bit more digging on understanding comms and team camaraderie, player personality, the role that, that that person will play. Like data helps you kind of cut down the swath of millions of players to like, here's the ones we should really focus on, right? And it still comes down to a little bit of the eye test, but, um, and, and other intangible aspects, but um, using data analysis has helped us on the, on the Valorant side for sure. Yeah, and with that, you know, and switching from gameplay to broader business operations, how would you say that 
the team, whether it's the data team or the EG team in general, kind of leverages the data analysis to provide strategic insights and really support the decision making within the organization. Um, think, so, oh, Chris, um, yeah, take it, so, um, my, so some people on our team do a lot of research heavy stuff where they're looking at our fan data and um, any correlations we have to certain partners or markets. And that really informs how um, even titles we may get into, honestly, and spend that we may have because of that. And it is all part of the mix to make that final decision. And it. It, it's kind of the case that you have to prove um, before you even make huge commitments like businesses have to make. Yeah, um, Chris, at, I, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even things like, you know, we uh, we look at segmenting some of our channels, right? So we have our own CSGO Twitter, we've got Domino's EG on Twitter. You know, we are looking at how do we better serve audiences and really like those aren't just like gut decision, oh, this makes sense. like. Or like, oh, I think this would be successful. Like we're actually like doing, you know, taking in the insights from our current audience and looking at other um, other platforms and other markers in the industry to make sure like, okay, does what we're doing from a uh, a business standpoint make sense? And will, will there be a payoff in the end for us? Um, we're not really making, trying to make gut decisions across across the company anymore. Or we're, yeah. we're, and we use it to confirm kind of those gut decisions too. We have to back those up. Absolutely. Now, before we get to our midpoint check-in, I do have one question um, from the chat. And the question is, what kind of data is available to you all? And what data do you use right now or plan to use in the future? Yeah, we work with a lot of game data. Uh, our biggest rosters being League of Legends, Counter Strike, and Valorant. So uh, while all three we have, we could get um, all all the data for um, League of Legends, Valorant, and Counter Strike. We really only work with two of them. Those being League of Legends and Counter Strike. Um, we have pipelines set up for Dota 2 if that were ever uh, the case in the future. Um, and we obviously would love to work with uh, Valorant data as well, but um, currently just because of resource, con resource constraints, um, that, uh, is not, uh, that is not a current uh, possibility. Um, but yeah, we, 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 have, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of in-game data. <laughs> Uh, to say the least, Counter Strike, especially, uh, really goes, really drills down to the like one one hundred twenty eighth of a second uh, frame. So uh, you can only imagine how much um, how much resolution we have when it comes to that Valve specific titles, um, for, for better or for worse. And some of our data we get from APIs. Some of it we have to go acquire ourselves. Um, so you know we, we have various forms of data acquisition. Absolutely. Well, before we go into our next set of questions, we want to take a quick pause and welcome everybody who's just joining us and tuning in to Smart Bytes powered by HPE. And we would also like to thank our official Data Insights partner, HPE, as this series would not be happening without them. You can find more about how EG is working with HPE using AI and machine learning to help our game strategy by clicking the link in chat. Now let's go ahead and dive into how data helps improve EG. So I'll open this up to all of you. How has the use of data analytics influenced your decision-making process within EG, both during gameplay or in the strategic planning off of the field? Yeah, I think my favorite example uh, is, is actually not, not my personal experience, but it's, the, it's my previous intern's experience uh, who, who was working with our old uh, Dota 2 analyst um, as he was, you know, um, as, as they were going through uh, the international. I, I remember, I think it was like a weekend or like a Saturday, I woke up to a bunch of like Slack messages from him saying like, oh my God, they actually implemented or like they actually uh, did the strategy uh, after I like you know gave them insight about the spider here like the specific spider hero? <laughs> I was just I was so confused because I didn't I didn't really understand Dota, 
or Dota 2. I mean, I watched it, but like I didn't really understand like the mechanics behind specific champions, or sorry, heroes, not champions. Um, but it was just really nice to see the kind of enthusiasm and also to see that like his efforts were, you know, eventually paid off uh thanks to you know our old dota 2 roster actually you know listening to him or you know the analyst that he was working with um yeah. kind of something that happened recently for me is um we have an internal tool that we call sign.gg where um we it's a tool where our coaches can go and get various um they have access to queries where they can get various insights on different places in the game but we also added in a vod tool recently so you can go to the vod and you can see every moment um, item, kill, or whatever team fight that happens within League of Legends. And um, you can see it really precisely. And not only does it help save our coaches time and energy because they can look at that point of time and that data point and, and review game film directly with the players, it also turns out to be a huge um, time saver for marketing, where if they're trying to look for a clip or something specific, they actually can use this tool and they can look at the time, the item, the event that happened, um, and gather statistics really quickly to kind of form some of the materials that they form as well. Awesome. And Ivan, with what you had mentioned, um, would you say predictive modeling has significantly impacted the core decisions of players' gameplay? You know, from that example, you said that your intern had actually seen it implemented in the game. So I'm just curious if there's any other examples or, or other opportunities that this has occurred before. This is also a question from chat. Yeah, I don't think predictive modeling uh, is actually the best way to present data or, yeah, to, to present data to uh, a pro player, basically you know, a player that is like top, I don't know, five, ten, uh, like not percent, literally top five or, or ten of his like uh, of the region, if not the world. So to give them a probability of saying like, hey, maybe you're wrong is not really a good thing. <laughs> we would probably get met with like a stone wall, especially since, you know, I'm like a plot League of Legends player at, at best. Um, so me telling someone like JoJo, like, hey, I don't think you should do that is probably not the way to go. Giving them more, um, giving them data or, or insights that they can actually take into action or, or test out is probably the, the best way to present data to them. Um, instead of saying, hey, there's a probability of that, you can probably give them, or sorry, not you can probably give them, but you could give them something more uh, set in stone, something that's, you know, uh, uh, an insight rather than a maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think from like the, one of my examples, which also is not mine, but uh, that last, you know, last year um, during uh, the LCS uh, summer split, um, we had some insights on like more data, right, and more placement, especially early game that was presented to the players, right. That's something that we pregame strat and provide insights so that you know gameplay decisions can be made. From that, there was like, okay, there's going to be a weak point. Um, around one minute or so, one, one minute, 15 seconds. And the players grabbed onto that in-game, went right after it, got the kill in lane and snowballed from there. And like, we, we never looked back and rolled to a victory. So like that, I think is, you know, right. They, they like to see it in a more like a digestible format that like probably is a little bit akin to like what they're used to seeing from a game, like a, scouting perspective and and then obviously like um it kind of has to work right if it, I, don't, I think like if it works they're gonna follow it more and uh and so like obviously it worked that time and and they continue to you know really buy into the things we're saying but like we're not trying to give them i think we have to be very careful about probabilities and giving the giving that to them because there's like the, the line of success is so thin that um sometimes taking the wrong guess is is uh like they could be too risk averse i guess to take take a chance on something yeah and with that kind of swapping perspectives a little bit in what ways does eg leverage data to scout and analyze opponent's gameplay and strategies and also how has this knowledge influenced the approach to matches and tournaments yeah, going back to kind of the work that uh, Angie has put in in, in regards to Counter Strike, uh, we we have been doing uh, a lot more scouting um, in terms of you know uh, figuring out contact timers, um, 
damage done during contact for that matter and how our players or, or players in general use uh, or use utility uh, during during matches and in, in some very specific uh, circumstances uh, and a lot of that again really is to um, make our coaching staff and our analysts lives just 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 a little bit easier um, so that they have more time to provide feedback to the players um, or to you know dig for insights on on other teams uh, before matches and um, you know any and every every second every minute really really does count uh, especially when their time is so valuable. Yeah, yeah. One of the, um, you know one of the other pieces where you especially as we have such rich League of Legends data you know working with um, working with HPE on some draft analysis tools right we can understand. Um, some of the proclivity of opponents in in their drafts and tendencies that they may make that we can prepare for and be ready for to essentially anti-strat them um, if they are to make those choices in a game, right? If they make a pick or ban and we know it's coming, the coaching staff can prepare for it and prepare like, okay, they make this, they, you know, they ban um, Aphelios, like what is our, what's the, what's the play, right? And what is the best opportunity for that? um following the band so or the pick right and with that is an area that HPE has really helped us out with over the um you know the last couple months and an area that I think we'll continue to prove upon because the, the pick band phase of League of Legends is even even Dota is so complex um that like yes you can use all you can go back and look at um you know, an opponent's matches, but like you can also take in data from across the globe and and see what other regions are doing in response. And I think that's an area like that we continue to to get better at um, and continue yeah. to use tools internally to, you know, to help our coaching staff be more efficient. Because there's no way that you know a single coach can go out and analyze all the drafts from CB Lowell, CK, you know, and down down the path and uh, to make heads or tails of it. Yeah, with that, um, would you say, you know, is there a time, you know, when data kind of led you astray? And how was that remedied? Hmm. If not, <laughs> we, can, we can we can come back to it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that. One well, I, I think some some areas where it's like, it's not going to be perfect, um, you know, is, is potentially around like some of the win probability modeling, you know, on on factor where like we have data for teams from China, but only when they play in, you know, international events. Right. And so when you have a small sample size, like you can't really like you can't take that you can't be very confident in the, in what you're going to get from a result standpoint. And so like, I would say like the data hasn't necessarily led us astray, but we have to be very careful about how we, um, how we utilize the data we had to like, to showcase any probabilities on the site. And I don't know, Ivan, if there's any more like color you can add or, or carry, but I think that's one yeah. area potentially where you can, you can get too confident in a small sample size and you have to be careful there. Actually, I think Ivan and I were on a call with Soham today and Angie, where we actually talked about this very thing, um, the scouting model that we're working on, where this is a good model, but we can't trust it quite yet. We need to give it time to acquire more data um, so we feel a higher confidence level in it. And so it's like, watch it, um, trust it slightly, but make it gain your trust with time. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree with that with that sentiment there's a lot of times where you really have to dig into your insights and understand whether or not your insights make sense so for example if i were working on a regression model and the coefficients the signs of the coefficients weren't what i would expect them to be uh, at that point i would really ask myself like is this model correct then um it, am i experiencing some form of like statistical phenomenon like simpson's paradox for example where i, I need to like start segmenting uh, my data into specific groups um so before before you before you know you, you get led astray try to figure out if you are even being led astray for, for that matter yeah awesome thank you all for that uh so 
kind of again changing gears a little bit ivan could you kind of discuss the role of heat maps or other visualizations in analyzing team dynamics positioning and map control yeah so we've definitely looked into uh into heat maps and um you know, uh, played around with quite a bit actually with with different ways to kind of visualize data. I think personally, my my favorite application, and you know, it's still a little bit up in the air as to how useful this application is, is um, prob probabilistic uh, heat maps. Um, to, to to put it simply, uh, which can essentially map out where we will expect players to be. Um, so kind of like. You know, we can go to a player and be, hey, you know, be careful around, you know, this specific area because this player might be uh, lurking over there. Or, hey, sweep this area because uh, the support usually wards around this area. Um, but, you know, again, when we're, when we're talking about probability, it's, it's not like the, the best thing to go to a, a pro player and say, hey, maybe this, this will, uh, will happen. Um, so if we're talking about usefulness, actually, one of my interns... Uh, is currently developing, or has developed rather, a, a heat map that can kind of identify information about kills in Counter Strike. So the you know the the who, what, when, where, and how answers uh, plus plus some more, um, all kind of visualized and, and and interactive, all all in a very very nice um, CS:GO radar map plot. And with that. Another question from chat we have is, how big of an improvement in performance of teams have you all seen since the implementation of data modeling? I mean, I think I think our Le League of Legends team kind of, if you look at it historically to today, um, especially last year, like you've seen a huge improvement um, and great performance. Yep. Um, especially like when you think about when we really started to ramp up, um, you know, 2022 was a very, very slow start for this team. Um, I think we were at 500 going into spring split playoffs. Right. And then you, you saw this team continue to succeed, even, you know, put up good fights on the international level, um, based upon the data and insights that we were able to provide. Um, you know, I know we're not, you know, we're not doing a ton with, Valorant right now, but you know our coaching staff is using data and insights from some third party providers to anti strat and to plan for um, plan for teams. And I think you're seeing some of that performance here. But definitely, League of Legends is a great example of that. Um, CS:GO, I think you you will start to see over the course of this second half of the year, ideally, right? Like as as Angie and Ivan and the team continue to build out the tools for them uh, that, you know, you, you will see an, ideally see an improvement in their performance um, over the second half of this year. That's fantastic. And to kind of change perspectives within, you know, EG going from gameplay and our players to the boardroom side, how would you say, you know, beyond in-game analysis, how do you utilize data in the boardroom to make strategic decisions related to team management, player acquisitions, and resource allocation? I mean, we are, you know, our, our gaming management team, um, at least when it comes to, like, players, like, it is not just, oh, this player is good. Like, there are scorecards. They are looking at the statistics of a player and potentially how they fit in with the team, especially in the role. Um, you know, we are also using some um uh what i'll say is like personal personal uh, excuse me personality surveys um we did for for our valorant combine and so like when we look at the hp futures combines that we've done for league of legends the you know the, the player acquisitions and potential players like are all you we're all looking at them from a data centric standpoint while we're also looking at them in scrim so i think from like from that standpoint you know, it's being utilized a lot by, or, or a lot and probably will continue to be by our gaming management. Um, like a business standpoint and resource allocation, Carrie, I don't know if you have an example on the marketing side of how potentially like the team is looking at, you know, putting putting content or certain people in content um, from, a, from an allocation standpoint. 
Yeah, I think I think one of the things that we discovered recently is people really, really engage with our creators. And so that's something that the data showed us, just looking at the insights and saying, hey, like, we should really lean into that. You know, we have, um, they're great collaborators with us. They're great representations of our fans and to our fans. And um, the data actually kind of really showed that and shined a light on that. Awesome. Now, Chris, I know you mentioned the combines that we had done with HPE, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the other projects that we have partnered with HPE on. So could one of you kind of talk about a little bit about, I just repeated myself, but could one of you talk about uh, what kinds of things has EG partnered with HPE on? Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll start off and then everybody can chime in. So um, one other thing that's been so fun about um, end of 2022 and 2023 is partnering with HPE's advisory and professional services team. And they've really come in, collaborated with us. They've met with us. They spent a lot of time talking to us to understand the problems that we need to solve. And some of the tools that we've built with them are our audio analysis tool. And this is basically a tool that um, takes our video recordings of our players' communications and it analyzes it, transcribes it, processes it, and it lets us know like what is the frequency between someone speaking? What is the frequency between other players speaking? Are they talking over each other? Are they, um, and, and as this is an MVP stage right now, but as we go forward, are we using command language when we should be using kind of more, less aggressive language at that time? And so it can really help us hone in to like how our commu communications are working between our team. It can show, tell us our sentiment, emotion, tone of our players. And I think with League, because, and or any five player game, and honestly, it, it, this is kind of one of those things where you might not know that maybe somebody's quiet too much at these really critical moments. It can really highlight that. So it can give our coach coaching moments so they can really, um, guide that player and work with them on their communication skills if that's a gap or maybe somebody's dominating the conversation too much and it's like hey you need to listen more or maybe they get flustered and angry and it need, they need to work with them on kind of moderation of temperament or something like that and so it's really kind of providing some insight there the other thing that's been super fun to work with hp on is our relationship analysis tool um we have spent a lot of time with uh the, the hpe team and uh our coaches directly on understanding how we can create, use machine learning um, and predictive modeling to help them have, uh, take that guesswork out of this. You get on stage and drafting's hard and you get flustered and players have opinions. But with this tool that they're building and we're iterating on right now and using today, um, it helps us understand like our opponents, how their lineup should look, how ours should look. Um, it helps us understand any clustering that happens. Maybe like something, it gives us kind of that agility to like respond to picks and bans, like right when we're in the middle of the game in the match on stage, making these um, real time decisions. Um, and it kind of, with the practice of using that machine, it, it just arms our coaches better to support our, our players. Um, I think the other thing that it also does is we talked about this a lot is, you know, our players have opinions and they have preferences when it comes to who they play um, in a match. And this the model that HP, they've created a way where we can add that to the model. We can take that into account so that when they give us recommendations on if um, opponent does this, we should do that. Like it's really helping us kind of guide um, and providing stats and uh, KPIs along the way that can help our players trust that this is what they should do versus make it kind of a guessing game for them. I kind of went off there. Anything anybody wants to add? <laughs> That's great. No, you you and you nailed it. I mean, they've been yeah, great it's fantastic. Awesome. So for this last leg of our Smart Bites panel, I'd like to kind of dive into some advice that you all might have for people looking to either break into esports or work with EG. So, what advice would you give to aspiring data professionals? looking to enter the esports industry, especially in roles related to data analysis and strategy, and what skills and experiences would you say are most valuable in this field? Um, I feel like just, just based on how 
how I got to EG, it's probably not the greatest advice for me to give because, you know, putting yourself out there and, you know, showing that you're passionate doesn't really directly result in a, you know, a, a job offer or like an internship offer, so to speak. Um, but uh, I guess like really, if, if, if you're really passionate about, you know, uh, esports and like gaming there's definitely various avenues you could you could go in in regards to being a data professional in this space um the uh, at least on the team side the, the 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 opportunities in data and just in like in tech is a little bit barren is probably the best way for me to put it um but you can always get you know involved in in esports on the pub publisher side too, uh, with with Riot Games, with 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 Valve, even Pokemon or sorry N Nintendo or both rather even have like you know um, their their own like uh, competitive gaming you know divisions. Uh, so the opportunities are opportuni opportunities sorry are out there, but maybe less so on the team on the team side, uh, unfortunately. I do think though, like Ivan, one of the things that kind of, kind of made your you visual to Chris when he was looking for it is like you had those hard skills, like that yeah. you need to work in this space as a data scientist. You know Python, you know R, you know SQL, um, you are understand data visualization libraries, and then also your like statistical mind is incredible. And so like if you're interested in data science and using data, like focus on those skills. Like one thing that Ivan does all the time is like for fun, like I know over Christmas you played with data oh. and you made a model, you know what I mean? And so like have fun with it, just play with it. Teach yourself, you know what I mean? How to use Python, how to, you know, teach yourself HPE GreenLake, you know, that's yep. a really, really great machine learning infrastructure uh, cloud software um, that we get to use with HPE. Um, so like learn those hard skills. Yeah, I would say um you know you probably like go go get your education and get your your skills at a you know anywhere right and start to just build that experience and then there will be more and more opportunities in esports as they come i think you can also look at you know there's a lot of people on the com esports competitive subreddits who are doing modeling there's some you know there's some discords available um so it's not like you if you just go work, you know, somewhere in a corporate job and, and get a lot of experience like you can't you still you can still do this on the side. You can there's public APIs for Riot games and, and Valve games where you can do your own, you know, your own work and analysis. Um, and then I'll also I'll plug like the Genius League, right? Like we have internship opportunities every, you know, twice a year. We have two different cohorts and. You know, the people who have come in to to be part of our internship team on the innovation side, you're getting like true real world experience. You're getting to work with our data scientists and engineers to build tools to work with this data. And whether you land at Evil Geniuses or somewhere else, like we've had people go on to to do an out sports analytics for the Boston Bruins. We had we have somebody going into NASA. We have someone at Amazon, right? Like there's people like you are getting a lot. Uh, a lot of on the job experience here and getting to like scratch that esports itch at the same time. Um, so, you know, keep your eyes peeled, evilgeniuses.gg slash genius league, I believe it is, but just go to our website and it's up on the top. Uh, you will see opportunities there. I think we may be closed for now, but uh, another cohort will come along. So, you know, keep your eyes on there. Absolutely. Cannot say enough about the genius league. We love the genius league. And, you know, kind of one of our final questions here, as members of the data team here at EG, how do you stay up to date with the latest advancements in data analytics and technology within the esports industry? I talked to Ivan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ivan, Herman, Andy, like everybody on the team. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I found a lot of people on LinkedIn too, that they push out a lot of content, especially with AI right now, that's super interesting. So find people that are publishing content around it and see what they're doing. They're always happy to share their projects. Yeah, uh, you know, definitely. Uh, I, I would say with, with the rise of like ChatGPT and its competitors, 
Uh, this has gotten a little easier because, you know, you can kind of just tune in the news and see, hey, it's ChatGPT 6000 uh, in like five years from now or whatever, and then read a research paper on like how, how it was, you know, developed. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I think in regards to the latest and greatest, uh, not all data scientists need to do that. Um, you, you certainly don't need to be a great you, you don't need to do that to be a great data scientist, but it, you know if if you're ever running into like a headache with you know the stereotypical SK learn packages, it doesn't hurt to kind of you know uh, open up you know open up your, your your favorite browser and look up the look up a uh, a research paper from someone from some PhD student who is you know studying machine learning or AI uh, and you know talking about a new fascinating way to kind of um, to, to do data analysis or, or a, new, a new algorithm, so to speak. I think one of the more interesting uh, research papers I've read in the past year, and yes, I, I, I do read research papers, as, as unfortunate as that sounds, um, <laughs> was about sports, sports predictions using uh, audience sentiment uh, via Twitter. Um, so this, this one person tried to, or this one researcher, I believe he was a master's student, um, attempted to uh, create a, a, a predictive model uh, using the traditional sports, you know, uh, analytics, as well as a sentiment component to see what the crowd uh, thinks it will win. So, like, what do experts think? What's the sentiment of the experts, and what what's the sentiment of, of fans? And it actually, from what I remember, it wasn't like a particularly uh, long um, uh, research paper or like a research. Uh, duration, but there was short-term benefits into incorporating some form of uh, NLP or sentiment analysis in, when, when doing uh, pred predictions. Yeah. That's actually so cool. So, you know, talking about research papers and, and other resources to really get a, a handle on what's going on in the world of data, Working at EG, what are some of the key strategies or best practices that you would recommend for effectively collecting, managing, and analyzing data in this fast-paced and dynamic world of esports? Yeah, uh, use Git and GitHub for that matter, because I mean, because you kind of have to use uh, <laughs> GitHub if you're using Git. Um, but you know, ha maintaining version control uh, of your code, uh, having having backups of different versions of your code. If there's ever a mistake, or if you ever, you know, if you ever run into a bug uh, because of a change that you made, you can always revert that change. Um, I think Git is a very important tool that any data scientist or or software engineer, or actually, I'm gonna refer to data scientists because I know software engineers use them. But Git is extremely, extremely important to, in my, in my opinion, to to use and master uh, and not necessarily master, but but you know, get familiar with. Awesome. And then one final question from chat: um, How do you think a master student could benefit from an internship with EG that loves gaming themselves? And does the data science intern roles typically lead to a full time employment with the team? Uh, at least for the uh, the f the first part of that question, um, as as what uh, you know a master student could could benefit uh, from an uh, internship with us, if you are a data science major or or you know want to be a want to be a data scientist, I think one of the biggest benefits when when working with our team is the fact that because we're so small, we have to kind of circumvent the whole. Um, this this terminology might be jargon, but it's, it's throw it over the wall, which is essentially basically data scientists create a model, they throw it to the software engineers, and the software engineers kind of productionize it and you know put it in the cloud. We don't have the resources to to just throw it over the wall. We kind of have to do it ourselves. So if you are a data scientist or a data science you know uh, data scientist prospect, uh, you know you you definitely get to learn what the other side of, of you know, productionizing uh, models is. Um, and that's super important because it's always very valuable to understand what your colleagues do. And this skill is also very valuable because uh, you get to communicate with software engineers better. 
if you are a software engineer uh, instead and you are working with us because we we have to do all of the, the software engineering work for data scientists um, it's it's I would say it's fairly valuable especially if you're going to be ending up working in a big tech tech industry or a, a big tech company to understand um, uh, how data scientists function and how you can uh, empower your data scientists to do their basically uh, do their jobs uh, more efficiently or you know uh, just make their lives a little bit easier especially if you go into tech it's most likely going to be some form of you know uh, product data scientists working on some form of a b testing and you know it's always helpful to help you know uh, streamline and productionize uh, their code so yeah glad you're here to answer that question <laughs> great answer uh -huh. All right, everybody. Now, before we wrap, I would love for you all to share where can people find and connect with you uh, after the panel tonight? I'll go first. You can find me at Carrie Sunderland on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, I'm at Yaps on Twitter, D E A P P S. Uh, you can also find me on, on, on LinkedIn as well. Uh, that's probably not what people expect me to use as a social media, but I use LinkedIn very often. So you can find me at Ivan Chang on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Well, thank you all again for joining us tonight. And we want to thank you for joining us this evening for the Genius League Smart Bytes panel powered by HPE with EG's Chris, Ivan, and Carrie. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and gained some insights on how we use data throughout our organization. And before we finally close out, we want to thank again HPE for helping us bring this to life. We're excited to continue this series on Tuesday, June 6th, for the driving force where we look deeper at how data is used to deliver EG's competitive edge. We look forward to everyone joining us on our next panel. And until then, keep an eye out for a special announcement from EG and HPE on June 6th. Thank you and have a great night.